Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Ramon Marimon, a professor and peer learner chair at the European University Institute. And it's a pleasure to have this session on lessons from financial assistance to Greece. Today is a very timely day to have that discussion because, as you know, two years ago, uh, it's already the last program of the ESM. And right now, the ESM has been given the green light, finally, to get uh, the reform of, the, of these institutes. It's also true that uh, the European Commission now is going to be in the position of opening up this all the program of the next generation. And therefore, it's going to be one of the major, if not the first, lenders in the world. Therefore, it's a good time to learn from the experiences. Login Almonia, who was uh, in the European Commission for 10 years, in economic affairs and in competition as vice president, has led the group to do this uh, report. And it will be the experience that I think we should get time to learn, not only from Greece, but also on how to handle public debt at the European level. It is the experience that uh, for many now are reluctant to get into DSM, meaning talking about the Greece problem. And I think that there is a lot of misunderstanding and it's a good time to learn from these lessons. We're gonna have, tell me just very briefly, I will introduce the speakers and then we can move to the discussion. Giancarlo Garcetti is professor in Cambridge. He was also Peer Werner chair. And he has experience on issues exactly on debt and macro and finance problems. So it's gonna be good to hear his views. Georges Pana Constantino was LSC PhD and after working at the OCD, has been a finance minister exactly in the years at the beginning of the crisis in Greece, in later environmental minister, and now is a professor in the School of International Governance. Alexander Stau is the director of the new School of International Governance. And he was, as you might know, minister in different forms in the Finnish government. In particular, he was finance minister in the time of the starting of the last program of the ESM. So he has plenty of experience on the ground and also now is joining the academic world. Gertrude Temple Guckerhel was in the Austrian Central Bank and in the board of the ESM Council, and he's been the first independent to evaluate the programs of the ESM. So that's the panel that's going to be with us. And later at the end of the, of the discussion, Nicola Gemaroli will be Secretary General of the ESM, will give us a little the view ahead. He was also uh, PhD from UI, and welcome all of you. So without further ado, let's, I give the word to Joaquin Almunia. Thank you. Thank you, Ramon, and thank you to the UI for the invitation for this uh, webinar. I want to present you the main conclusions and the recommendations of this evaluation report. I received the mandate as in independent evaluator to carry out this uh, work from uh, the then uh, chairman of the Board of Governors of the ESM, Mario Centeno, with the uh, strong cooperation and support from Klaus Reglin, the, the managing director of ESM. And I worked with a fantastic uh, team chaired by Kari Korhonen that is, is also following these uh, debates. I will share my screen now to present you in a few slides the uh, purpose, the conclusions and the recommendations of this evaluation report. 
that was adopted in June this year by the Board of Governors of the ESM that are the finance ministers of the Euro area. We have started the work looking at what was the problem uh, for this evaluation covering since the uh, private sector involvement decision and the uh, EFSF program in 2012 till the end of the ESM program in 2018. And we covered also the first year of the implementation of the post program uh, objectives and instruments. Uh, the problem was, of course, the loss of market access or the threat of loss of market access, starting by Greece and after was followed by other Euro area countries. The concern was the risk uh, represented by these uh, uh, serious problems for the Euro area integrity, even with, with risks of a Grexit at some moments and the fear of a spillover contagion negative effects of this spillover contagion to other members of the Euro area and the strategic objectives as defined by the two programs under evaluation were to preserve the Euro area integrity and stability, to restore financial stability in Greece and to achieve sustainable inclusive growth. I go now to the conclusions, the main conclusions of the report what was the contribution of Greek programs to Euro area financial stability? <clears throat> in my view, the main conclusions were to preserve integrity and restore confidence in the single currency. The evolving recognition during these years of the Economic and Monetary Union design flows to the uh, private sector involvement with the uh, uh, restructuring of, of debt the banking union and even the creation of the ESM in 2012. Uh, the Greek program has contributed to, the limit, to limit the negative spillovers to other members, even if the programs couldn't avoid other serious problems in at least four other members of the Euro area. And uh, the programs achieved to greater, uh, a greater focus on banking sector issues that were not really Taken, in, taken into account when the programs were designed. The effects on the Greek economy, of course, a qualified success on the stability of the economy throughout these years. But other conclusions about these effects were not totally positive. Excessive prioritization on fiscal adjustment, as was analyzed during the uh, drafting of the, of the report, the uh, lack of uh, synchronization between product market reforms and labor market reforms, the product market reforms lagged behind, and the weak foundations for medium to long term for the Greek economy, even if the success of the stability of the economy has been uh, strongly recognized by the, almost all the observers. The strategy for sustainable and inclusive growth. Uh, well, the, there are uh, conclusions that are positive, but not fully positive. The stronger social safety nets that were promised by the EFSF program were only really implemented during the ESM program, during the last program. The banking sector shock absorption capacity remains weak at the end of the program uh, uh, implementation in, in, uh, under the evaluation period and the, until the third quarter of uh, last year. And in the long run, potential challenges remain for the ESM as a, a very important creditor of Greece due to uh, long maturities of the debt. The Greek economy's resilience to shocks has improved indeed, but not fully. The reform agenda is not yet completed. One year after the end of our evaluation uh, project, the programs increased the resilience of the banking sector 
even with these uh, difficulties to cope with the shocks mm -hmm. and the program strategies, because this lack of a fair distribution of efforts between uh, the public sector and the private sector, citizens and companies, the program strategies challenge societal unity in Greece. The previous conclusions, as you can imagine, uh, put some concerns on sustainability. The fiscal consolidation targets weighed on the growth necessary to reduce debt to GDP ratio. That was one of the most important strategic objectives, but the inconsistency between, between the fiscal consolidation targets and the targets for the uh, reduction of this debt to GDP ratio can be observed at the end as a conclusion. And disagreements between Commission and IMF on debt sustainability assessment created difficulties for program implementation and provoked uh, that the adoption of the decision was uh, not only difficult, but sometimes delayed. And the ownership. Institutions achieved, institu when I talk about institutions, I talk about the Commission, the Eurogroup, the uh, European Central Bank, and the IMF, the components of the so-called Troika in the previous years. These institutions achieved a considerable degree of cooperation, but the parties did not share common diagnosis and solutions. And this also created pro problems, not only because of the delay of some important decisions, but also in terms of ownership and the lack of coordinated and comprehensive communication and advocacy created serious problems of ownership into, into the Greek uh, governments, institutions, political parties, social partners, and so on and so forth. And now a very quick view on the recommendations that are under my exclusive responsibility. As I said before, the report counted with a very crucial support for this uh, team group allocated by the ESM, but uh, the, the recommendations are my exclusive responsibility. I can mention uh, five groups of recommendations, but I will uh, make a synthesis in three slides. This first slide on a strategic program objectives and guidance on program design. I recommend that the future ESM programs must clearly define strategic objectives based on the long-term view, not only on uh, the reduction of fiscal imbalances. Growth in the beneficiary country is a necessary condition for the success of every program. If not, the lack of consistency between different targets is obvious. The program design should derive its, its objectives and length from an analysis of the main problems to be tackled. Not all the problems, the problems to be tackled can be solved in a, a three years time. That is the normal length of these kind of programs until now. All programs should ensure a fair distribution of efforts across society. Programs should establish a limited number of macro critical conditions at the end, the ESM program, the third of the Greek programs, <coughs> accumulated <coughs> more than 150 different conditions in a big list that is impossible to be uh, fulfilled, implemented in this uh, period of time. And the program should establish an appropriate sequencing of reforms. I made reference in the conclusion to this uh, inconsistency. Other recommendations on guidance, about the program preparation and implementation. The sustainability assessment needs a broader focus beyond debt levels. The program approval should explicitly assess exit strategy options and not only the creation of a cash buffer as, what the as was the case in the ESM program and a post-program incentive structure and building and improving a beneficiary country's institutional and administrative capacities require cooperation between institutions. I also refer to this degree of cooperation before. And the final group of recommendations regards the post-program engagement. 
a strong and coherent framework for post-program monitoring is needed to safeguard adjustment gains and ensure sustainability. The ESM, also the Commission, even if the Commission is not the direct addressee in these recommendations, must pay attention to the role of advocacy, not only rely on market pressure or peer pressure, but also to make an effort on uh, advocacy to try to uh, draw the attention of the beneficiary country, which are the problems and the need to tackle those problems and what kind of solutions the programs are proposing. The ESM must strengthen relations with the authorities of the beneficiary country, as well as political forces and civil society. In my view, during the implementation of the programs, these relations with uh, political forces, including the parliament and the civil society, were not very, very strong. And uh, developed capacities to be aware of the interconnections and potential negative spillovers with the other Euro area countries. These are my recommendations. Probably uh, later on, uh, Nicola Giamaroli will refer about how the ESM will uh, work based on these uh, recommendations in the future. And a final slide, uh, the pandemic. One year after the end of this evaluation, the pandemic blew up and of course created problems, is creating problems in Greece that uh, makes the situation now worse than the situation one year ago. Uh, we need to think how to continue reforms in labor and product markets. We will count, or Greece will count, with new financial instruments coming from the EU, not only from the ESM and the uh, guarantees and other uh, financial instruments coming from EIB, the European Investment Bank, but now the EU as such will provide substantial resources for Greece and to any other EU countries through this new generation EU, but also through other instruments such as SURE. We need to think about the absorption capacity, how this capacity has improved, is enough or not to work with this new flow of resources and objectives, and how to improve ownership. I can refer, just naming them, positive elements now in Greece, the declining cost of finance, of course, the effort to buttress implementation capacity has uh, uh, given positive results, not full results, but positive results. Now there is more attention to privatization. And this is one of the elements, not the only one, but is contributing to the improvement of confidence in Greece. And the challenges, the fiscal space is again under pressure by the pandemic expenditure and the lack of revenues, unemployment, has increased again. The resolution of asset quality issues that was not fully completed during the implementation of the ESM program is again on top of the agenda for the uh, functioning of the banking sector and the financial stability in Greece. And there is a need, a strong need to create conditions to increase investments, both private and public. That was one of the deficits that we analyzed during the drafting of the report. These are my uh, main comments, uh, Ramon. Thank you very much. And let's uh, pass to the other uh, participants in this debate. Thank you. Thanks again for a very timely presentation, a very synthetic. The report is a report that really is getting to a lot of details. Even it's very interesting, even in the annexes. And I recommend you to go through this. But just want to see three things that you mentioned at the end. The first is importance of growth as a necessary condition for success of a program. And that's the picture where we are. This is the GDP normalized at the beginning of the crisis in 2008. And that's a whole big recession, and, but that's where we are now. And here, this last program, 2015, we saw a little of growth, but we still a lot to go. You also mentioned the importance of the debt sustainability analysis. 
So I need, oops. And here's what we can see. The last debt is sustainability analysis of the European Commission, who is doing the, those analysis at the European level. So that's a year ago. And at that point, they were saying, well, things were improving, but still you'll think about gross gov government gross financing needs will be around 10% at the 2013. <clears throat> they were also predicting that even if you shock the economy, uh, the probability that the debt will be higher in 2024 than 2019 was only 3%. So this 3% we had gone way above we already in 2007. So let's see. And you also mentioned the thing of a conditionality. And here we've been doing some work with the researchers at the ESM because there is a, now a data set of all the programs. Uh, and, uh, when you did the report, you didn't have that data set uh, available. Now it is. And looking at this, yes, exactly what you mentioned. On average, the eight years that the SM was involved in programs were 172 new conditions, while the IMF had only 78. But more important is that when we test for what is the compliance, which kind of conditions from compliance of the programs is a very small number. And actually we do it by sectors is the financial sector policies and fiscal measures, which is in the case of Greece only 11%. The bulk are fiscal, labor, and product market structural policies. So it is this person don't have a role on compliance. So without uh, spending more time, I wanted to move to the speakers in the presentation. And let's start with Gertrude, please. And I have a question, a very simple question to all of them, which <clears throat> is being in this situation now, and looking ahead, particularly looking ahead with the responsibilities that the Europe is gonna to have to do after the COVID or within the COVID crisis, which are the lessons that you think are more important that can extract from the experience, also from the report? And if you have any particular question for Dr. Munia, I think I'm sure he will reply. So Gertrude. Thank you. Thank you, Ramon. Just one remark. I was not on the board of the ESM, but the European Central Bank. For Excuse me. <laughs> no, no problem. Yeah. My screen had gone completely out. That was... No, I was no, 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 please, no, no. <laughs> yes. Maybe board of the ESM is a supervisory board and a little less work, maybe. Yeah. Sorry, you got completely yeah. out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, first of all, let me congratulate uh, Joachim on, on this report because it, it was produced under very difficult circumstances uh, in the middle of the pandemic. And it was on a very sensitive topic, which is Greece. But he did it in a very uh, open and constructive way. I think it is a very good report. It's really worth reading in, because it's rich of information and, and uh, food for thought. And when we did the first report, uh, three years, uh, first evaluation report, it was somewhat easier because uh, most of the countries, uh, most of the program countries uh, were out of the woods by then. Yeah? Uh, this was really a different, a different time. And it's also worth mentioning um, how great the contribution of, of the team under the leadership of uh, uh, Kari Kohenen was. Uh, because this kind of self-reflection in an institution is important to develop it further into the future. I would like to first to quote five points out of the report, which seem to uh, be of uh, importance. This, this is under the chapter of something fundamentally wrong or missing on pages 44 and 45. And the first point is, Financial assistance did address some of Greece's most immediate needs, but insufficient attention was paid to the social needs of the population. The second point is that the institutions adapted to unintended outcomes, but only slowly, partly because they initially underestimated the problems and partly because they suffered from recognition lags. Third point is 
Similarly, lessons had been learned about macroeconomic, uh, macrocritical structural reforms in program conditionality. And while the ESM program approach changed to better fit Greece's social needs, uh, a three year program was too short to address Greece's long standing mm -hmm. vulnerabilities. So, how can we see the uh, achievements of the ESM eight years after its start. I think the first point is that the ESM gives countries time to adjust. Because uh, remember the first program in 2010 was designed for 18 months. Yeah, was in the end was impossible to achieve all the objectives uh, which were meant to be achieved. The second point is that the ESM can give support to countries to a considerable degree. And I think there is no single transfer program in the EU which does the same. Now, it is a considerable support in the sense that lowering the interest rates is a kind of transfer. And in the, in the case of Greece, it's amounting to around 6% of GDP, I think. But of course, it also requires a strong long-term commitment from the, from the country uh, receiving this support. And what does this mean for the future? Because the, the last crisis does not repeat itself in the, same, in the same form. So at the moment, we are in a period of extreme uncertainty and you have shown the gross figures and unfortunately, it's not going up at the moment, but it's really uh, going down again due to the second wave of, of infections. And um, governments and the ECB try to compensate stress in the system, but one day they will, they will uh, um, stop this, this support. We are not there yet, but uh, what will happen then? And I think we should, we should do this reflection of what comes after this immediate firefighting during the crisis. And uh, we can assume that the, the growth will be less good than assumed a few months ago. Unemployment will remain high. Uh, the climate change uh, will uh, require transformations of some, some very important sectors in the European economy, like the automotive industry. Traffic and tourism will be hit I think it will not be easy to bring them back to the previous levels. And this is an issue for countries like Greece, for, for Spain, for Italy, for Portugal. It's also for my own country, for Austria, it's, a, it's an issue. And we, have, we should not forget that we have high rollover needs, that rollover needs in, 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 in some countries. And uh, the aftermath of the crisis will also mean that we have stress in the banking system. And the ECOFIN will have a great responsibility uh, designing the fiscal rules for the future. So the question is, will the ECB and e uh, European Commission support be sufficient to stimulate the recovery? Or will there be a role for the ESM in the future as well? I think it was good that the ESM reform was adopted by the uh, ECOFIN a few days ago. And originally the ESM provided financial support and this brought interest rates down. But has the ESM also a, a role in the recovery or in the restructuring? Uh, could it be involved, for instance, in bank restructuring? Because there is clearly an institutional gap between the single supervisory mechanism and the SRP in, in Brussels, yeah? because banks go to the SRP uh, close to failure. And uh, could, could there also be um, a role for the ESM in a kind of long-term financing? Uh, could the ESM, it's just a question to the, to the panel, could the ESM create a facility which goes beyond the immediate objectives of recovery uh, because the ESM has a larger time horizon than the European Commission. Uh, it can raise funds for a very long uh, time frame, and it could accompany structural uh, improvements. But this all, uh, of course, depends on the, on the shape of the crisis. We are by far not yet out. 
and also on the willingness of governments to, to take uh, joint efforts. Thank you. George? Thanks very much, uh, Ramon. Um, about 11 years ago, around this time, we were sitting down with uh, Joaquin trying to figure out what to do. Um, he was the commissioner at the time. Uh, I was the new finance minister who discovered the disaster. And I don't think either of us had an idea at the time about how long and difficult it was going to be. So with this as a background, um, let me share some slides and, and try and make a few remarks on, on the report and beyond that. So I want to make four, I want to address four issues. Um, the report itself, uh, the lessons that for, from the assistance to Greece going beyond the report, what these imply for the situation Greece is now and a word in the end on the broader role of the SM as we move ahead. And I'll, I'll, I'll stick to my seven, eight minutes as requested uh, by Ramon. So let me first say that this is uh, an extremely complete, analytically very rigorous report, uh, which is also very honest. And I think that, you know, those of us that have been involved in, in the Greek episode, uh, read through some of these uh, phrases that I have here, inadequate strategies, strained implementation capacity, lack of common diagnostic Greek problems, weak ownership, insufficient attention to underlying social needs, stakeholders implicitly settling for a low growth equilibrium, uh, composition of fiscal adjustment not conducive to inclusive growth, uh, debt restructuring marked by significant delays, disbursement process driven more by liquidity needs than by reform implementation. And we do recognize a lot of what was wrong throughout this period, knowing of course at the same time that this was an evolving process uh, which in the process corrected many of the problems that, that, that were there in the beginning. Uh, and I was particularly struck by some of the comments, uh, uh, for example, the last two phrases, program set in motion, a change in attitudes, but little evidence that supports a more fundamental transformation, something that I, will, I would completely agree with, and no broadly accepted analysis on why the country fell into the crisis and what should be rectified has emerged. I think that's that's part of the problem that we're still facing. So um, we, we often forget uh, how badly we got it wrong in the beginning. And this is one of my, my favorite graphs that I always put up. Uh, the blue lines are the projections at the time of the first program, the Greek loan facility, the first MOU, May 2010. The red lines were the, the second program uh, the gray line is uh, the SM program and the yellow is the actual result. So you can see how we got it completely wrong in the beginning, uh, thinking that GDP growth was going to go only to minus four, it ended up going down to minus 10. Think that unemployment was going to, to peak at 15%, it, it peaked at 27. Uh, being overly optimistic about how we could reduce the deficit and thinking that debt was going to peak at 150%, it actually peaked much higher. The second program was more realistic. Uh, and it's, it's interesting that the third program, uh, based on the projections by the commission in November 2015, actually erred in the other direction. So it was slightly more pessimistic than what the, um, the, 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 the outcome was. So it thought unemployment would stay a little bit higher, it went down faster, it thought that debt as a percent of GDP would go even higher, it actually improved, et cetera. So there's been a learning process here, but, and I think this is something that uh, Ramon also mentioned, we have to keep in mind throughout all this, what a, a that this, the Greek episode, uh, the Greek crisis only compares with the US Great Depression of 2932. It is as deep as that, and it is twice as long. So the economic and social cost has been absolutely huge. Now, going on to some of the, the lessons that I draw from this, and, and, I, and I put them in four categories. There's some First of all, it, I think it's fair to say that we all got it wrong. 
program countries got it wrong, Greece, uh, first of all, and successive Greek governments, before, much more, and even during the crisis, the Commission and the EU got it wrong, the IMF got it wrong, markets got it wrong. Uh, and there's four types of, of lessons. There's some generic lessons which go beyond this particular crisis, that things catch up with you, problems accumulate and delay has costs. Uh, that negotiation is a delicate game which involves multiple rounds and trust is important, it's not a game of chicken. And that reform governance is part art and part science. So it's not just the tools and the metrics, it's also how you put it together and how you, you implement. There's lessons on program design and, and uh, the, the, uh, uh, the report goes through a lot of these. Um, it's clear that we did not have an optimal fiscal path. Uh, it was driven by the funding envelope. Uh, the, the targets were driven by that, how much money the countries were willing to put down, not what would have been a, an optimal fiscal path. It was clear that it was very hard to get the right balance between expenditure cuts and tax hikes. I think uh, this is one element of the report in which I'm not in complete agreement. I think that it overplays the, the importance of expenditure cuts. Actually, I think it was more on, tax, on, on taxes. Uh, the distribution issues and inequality and the sequencing issue of reforms. And uh, the, the report makes it clear, for example, that labor market reforms without product market reforms is catastrophic for the economy because real wages go, go, go down and therefore uh, the economy tax. And the question of, of debt restructuring and solvency, uh, which is of course something that you, that is very hard to pin down uh, when you're in it. Implementation issues. Political capital wanes, you need to front load reforms, you have to lead from the top and make sure everyone has skin in the game and many successive Greek governments uh, were not all on the same page in terms of what needed to be done and not everyone within the government was on the same page and finding a way to, to overcome the constraint of, of implementation capacity, which in, in the Greek case was a very important one. And finally, the, issue, the, the lessons on governance, uh, accountability, legitimacy, transparency, decision-making, the fact that election cycles matter, um, that we tend to do economic analysis, but at the end of the day, uh, politics is always, if not usually, Trump's economics. And I think one of the criticisms one would have of, of, of the SM report, which is a completely understandable one, is that it kind of shies away from discussing the political background, which drove actually a lot of the decision-making, some of the worst decision-making throughout this crisis. So my third point, um, what now? Is Greece today better prepared to deal with the COVID crisis? I think that, first of all, there's still no common narrative. There's no national reckoning out of this, of this whole period, which I think to me is one of the biggest problems. We are going in 2020, if you look at the OECD uh, uh, data that was released a couple of days ago, we're gonna have about the same GDP decline as we did in 2011. So we're back to the worst point of the Greek sovereign debt crisis. And the fiscal hit is gonna be severe. Debt, uh, one of uh, Ramon's slides showed it also, is gonna go above 200%. We never thought we'd get there, but we are. So all this is, is terrible, but we are in a different crisis and the underlying conditions are very different, both internally and externally. And internally, I think that there's been a lot of progress in terms of structural and institutional improvements, which makes you a little bit more hopeful in terms of how you come out of this. But the main game changer is the change of the, in the external environment, the change in the EU funding and the EU response, which was not there in the Greek crisis. And we can perhaps in discussion come back and discuss you know, moral hazard issues and how they played then and they're not playing now, which is a huge difference. Finally, my, my final slide and my final points, DSM moving forward. Now it's clear that DSM uh, has matured over the years. It can and, and I'm sure will usefully draw the lessons from Greece. It's, it's good to see that this kind of exercise I'm sure will be internalized by, by the institution. It is, as an institution, in the center of the debate on EMU reform, could be the basis for a European monetary fund. But there is a concern and there is a, a, an issue here whether it is being overtaken by events. Uh, countries have little interest at the moment to access ESM fundings. We have created every crisis, we, uh, we invent new tools and we have invented some tools which are probably better than the intergovernmental solutions that we used in the last crisis. So 
uh, you know, the, the commission borrowing the markets on behalf of the community. What, would that, what does that mean for the role of ESM? The ECB with the, the, the pandemic uh, emergency purchase program is taking away part of the ESM role in terms of acting as a liquidity lender of last resort. And finally, my, my last point, we have the decision of the Eurogroup a couple of days ago. Is it a game changer? I don't think it is because it, uh, it yes, the SM is now one year earlier, the backstop to the, to the resolution fund. However, we haven't, we're not seeing yet the broader ESM reform, which is needed to make sure it has a central position in the new governance arrangements for the EMU as we move forward. And I will stop here. That was very thoughtful, not missing a point, both in the report on the situation of Greece and also giving some hope and some good questions. So let's proceed to Giancarlo. Yeah, thank. can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you for inviting me. I, uh, I enjoy the report. And uh, I don't know slides, so let me be schematic. I want to make three points. First, uh, going very quickly through the inner structure of the report, talk briefly about uh, the, uh, uh, the role and, and nature of the ESM, and uh, finish uh, with some comment on what tools we need to perform the role of the ESM, whichever institution will perform those roles, like whether it's a European Monetary Fund. Or so uh, uh, if you have you know, a few hours to, to, to read the report, 170 pages, uh, it's good reading. Uh, there are like five uh, very well-structured uh, points, uh, relevance, basically telling you that uh, at the beginning it was mostly about financial stability at the European, uh, at the EA level and for Greece. Uh, we didn't want Brexit, we didn't want contagion. And uh, the, the relevance ends with, with a very sad note already noted. We all settled for a low growth future. So, <laughs> All this stability was predicated on expectation of low, grow, low growth for a lot, long time. Relevance. Effectiveness was basically uh, understanding what did not work well. And here the list is, uh, is strong. Inequality, social welfare, debt overrun creating no investment, uh, high borrowing cost, brain drain. No gain in product competition, but all the, black, the, old, all the adjustment put on the labor cost, which was already mentioned before. If you do reform in the labor market without reforming the product market, there are problems there. Still a lot of problem in public sector efficiency and effectiveness and remaining lots of fragility in the banking system. Then you go to efficiency, which is how, how, how well we achieve whatever was achieved in terms of cost. And here is uh, uh, opening the wound of the PSI, the long delay of the PSI, the, uh, everything that sort of at one point was discussed there, and one could argue whether it is a political problem or economic problem, but also a change in lending framework over time, uh, you know, with engagement with banks. And here comes conditionality, and, and you know, the, the idea that uh, if you want to make conditionality ineffective, you just go for a proliferation of points so that you can use the points you want, like in the supermarket and go with it. It's something that, to be fair, is also there sometimes in the IMF history, like look at the engagement with Turkey, you know, uh, at the beginning of the, of the new century. Then we go to sustainability. And here, the problem is how we refocus from, away from uh, the financial uh, crisis to uh, long-term objective. And here is really like documented the enormous shift in gear of official funding in the Euro area or the EU versus the standard, the IMF practice. I've been writing about this. The, the report does a very good, good, good job. And, and basically we realize that we need to have different principles. And uh, uh, already Gertrude uh, uh, said that, we realize that adjustment take time. 
the same way in which the German give their internal stability pact to landers enormous time to adjust, we need to, to give our own member state time to adjust. And uh, but at the point with adjustment time, since we were developing institution, came like a sort of, okay, let's stop everything and create breathing space, right? We, we, create, we create a breathing space with a particularly generous long-term uh, uh, loans. And then the last bit is cooperation. And this cooperation is really why the ESM cannot be the IMF, because you know, we are different. There is more strong regional ties. Uh, and, and remember the debate of whether we want to have upfront debt relief or, or like engagement for 40, 30 years. In the report, basically the comment is that uh, it, it was better for something like the European Union to remain engaged. Right? This is like a different, completely different uh, 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 attitude, the IMF, given the different structure. But this, at the same time, raised the issue of what is the house, what, what is the roof of the, of the, of the uh, uh, ESM, what is his mandate, what is his budget, what is this uh, governance, what is the accountability. The report is very well written, very carefully written, and then from time to time there is a sentence that comes as a cloud. You know, remember when in your family, your father and mother say, you are a good guy, I know you have been there, but you know, you need to get a better grade at the school. And that's, that's what it is. There are lots of these sentences. It becomes almost a, a game to find what these sentences are. For example, I just want to give you this fantastic, the, some of the sentences were already quoted and this, um, uh, uh, the institution had assumed almost frictionless economic adjustment and a rapid shift of resources. That was right. I remember screaming to people at the ECB, at the EC, saying you must be out of your mind if you think that people in Greece can go from being a pump station attendant to a, a, a software developer, because that was a kind of the ideology that at some, at some point that was there. Or uh, um, uh, this sentence, requires swift adjustment to ESM internal process information system, especially with regard to conducting the interest rate swap arrangement. And by the way, uh, the, the slide on interest rate risk, remember, this is a surprise. A few years ago, we expected interest rate increase. If you deal with the interest rate increase with, with swaps, like uh, in 2017, Greece did, now you pay more. There is a lot of cost there, right? And, 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 and the developer, having done uh, trials in London on derivative contracts, I can tell you those things are difficult to manage. And today we may be in the same situation after 2007, you now with all the swap and derivative expecting the increase in, in interest rate. By the way, so let me come to, to what I, I want to say in, in the second part. So those are beautiful sentences. I, I, really, I should do a little bit of a, a collection of those for the heart of the report. So I want to make, I want to discuss two points. The first one, we really do not know what the ESM is going to be. And, and I go, you know, I, I don't have to add much because George already raised this, this problem. Uh, it doesn't operate in, in a vacuum. The ECB, the, you know, in 2012, the ESM change came to life with the ECB, the OMT, the banking union. Uh, now with COVID, we go from intergovernmental to, to, to EU-based. This was a point already made. Uh, so the question is, the ESM cannot be a, a, a club of creditors, cannot be a club of creditors. It must be an institution that sort of create the multiple level of ownership of this program. This program have an ownership problem at, at member state level, Greek level, but also an ownership problem at EU or EA level. So it's a difficult institution to think but uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, remember, it must be also tooled up because the size and the scale of interventions are huge. So those are like billions and billions. So in a way, it must be a super tooled up institution. And reading through the report, one of the points there is that uh, there must be a capacity and expertise build up in the ESM or the EMF or whatever can come, come, come after that, because it, it will be important to know what they're doing. And um, um, 
so this brings me to the last, uh, I mean, that would be sort of a little bit of an analogy with, with the central bank, right? The central bank at this stage has an enormous balance sheet policy. There is an enormous uh, value at risk there at stake. Uh, there is uh, a, a forward guidance, an enormous investment in communication, an enormous investment in explaining you know, what are the goals and what are the the ownership of the action of the central bank. For the SM, it's even, it's even stronger, the problem. So I come back to the last uh, 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 thing, which I think, okay, we created this breathing space. We avoided the wars. I mean, a, 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 a friendly way to read the report is that, look, it, 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 it would have been a disaster. We avoided that, okay? Then we started to learn from our mistake. We, we maybe perhaps owe an apology with the ideological view that sort of, uh, blinded us at the beginning, made us blind, no? not to see the problem that we were creating, especially at the very beginning. But now the breathing space cannot be a space of just putting your head in the sand and waiting for 2032 to redo another DSA, right? It's a little bit strange. Now is the time to build expertise, capacity, and, and tools. And here it is, that sustainability analysis that is now become a sort of a bad word to say, bad, bad, bad acronym. And, and it's a forbidden fruit because on the one, on the one side is a technical tool for taking decision and monitoring. On the other side is uh, part of the communication. And I spare you the, the quotation very nice in the report saying that uh, markets understand the problem and, and they, 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 they get their own uh, solution. So uh, uh, I, I understand the problem of uh, technical tools and part of communication also understand that nobody knows how to do DSA for 20, 30 years, but there are good things that the ESM has established. One is the attention to flow versus stock. They understand liquidity much more, in part because they have the money to intervene. I mean, for the IMF, which is, with all due respect, a, a, a spectacle, a small bit in the world financial market, it cannot be too ambitious. The ESM can be ambitious because he has the money, so he understand, they understand liquidity. Second, DSA is not a forecast, but is a conditional assessment. Meaning, if I want to push some reform, if I want to give a loan, if I want this condition to happen, how will this play out? So it is not a forecast, it's a conditional assessment. And here where the ESM understood something very nicely, which is, is condition on the policy in the country, is conditional market participation, but it's also conditional on the official lending framework in which the country works. Like uh, having a, a, an assessment of uh, the sustainability without taking into account the OMTs by the ECB makes no sense. Because the OMTs is there, certain scenarios are not there anymore. Mm. And so it's always, con so it's very important to understand what we condition our DSA on and also, unfortunately, we now understand that we need to take care of tail risk and COVID is one of the... I think I'm, I finished my, my time. This is what I want to say. I have something more, but it could be later. I just want to, to finish that. Uh, uh, remember, the same way in which in 2012, I think we were a little bit wishful thinker, <laughs> especially on, on the rapidity of the adjustment. Today, we, we cannot repeat the same mistake and think that you know, the fact that we have 20 years in which we don't have to worry about the interest bill of Greece because it's only one or 2% of GDP, I think it's foolish. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, especially if we start to, to take a little bit more action like the interest rate swap, which I understand is not a small thing in Greece. And, uh, and that will take quite a bit of expertise and uh, uh, it would be very important to have this reform of ESM conducive to bring more, you know, uh, articulate uh, uh, tools to the table, of course, mediated by political consideration. But again, uh, uh, it's not the time to, 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 to wait and do nothing. Thanks, Giancarlo. So we move to the last finalist, Alex. Thank you very much much Ramon and good evening, good afternoon to um, everyone. Really nice to be here. Uh, I was wondering what my value added would be and um, I was listening to my good friend and colleague George. Both of us have a PhD from the London School of Economics and Political Science. 
I always hasten to add. So he is the real economist with a political sense, and I'm just a political scientist with a sense of and a feeling of what actually happened when we were putting uh, the ESM together. I've had the opportunity to read the report in a politician type of a way, uh, Joachim. That means that I've read the uh, executive uh, summary, I've read your uh, recommendations, and I've read the conclusions. And I obviously really like what I've read, but it did bring back uh, a lot of memories. As far as the recommendations are concerned, I'd be willing to take all of them on board. But at the same time, I should say that those recommendations can work uh, with the benefit of hindsight, not in the middle of the crisis. And probably when George opened up by saying that the two of you met 11 years ago, you didn't know where this was going to go. I think that was basically all of us. So what I'll try to do now is to give the argument, quote, politics trumps economics. So how we saw it from the Finnish side. And I was fortunate or unfortunate in the sense that I joined the government as foreign minister in 2008, right before Lehman Brothers collapsed and the financial crisis, which led to a sovereign debt crisis, which led to a euro crisis began. And I left government in 2016, just when everything started to look good again. So this is probably a good reason for uh, the Finnish electorate never to vote me in again, because it always spells trouble. Now, I'll try to explain what happened uh, from a political perspective, because you always have to put any recommendation and the reflection on the ESM um, into that context. The way in which I saw it from 2008 to 2011 was very much a sort of survival exercise. Uh, I remember being in budgetary negotiations in Finland in August 2008, where all of our top economists from the Bank of Finland were telling us that we're looking at a growth path of roughly 3 to 4% in 2009. This was one month or a few weeks before uh, Lehman Brothers. And minus 6% later in the next budgetary meeting that we had in August 2009, you realize that a lot of things had happened. I also remember having excessive crisis meetings in the middle uh, of the establishment of the ESFS and uh, then finally of the ESM. And it became very much a political debate where you had the government versus the opposition. The opposition bashing as hard as it possibly could and using pretty much the Greek situation um, as a stick. And the argument at the time was, yes, very much about austerity and very much about the um, uh, stability and growth pact and very much about why haven't uh, the so-called program countries stuck to the principles that we established earlier in order to uh, stick to the MU. And even though we were a very pro-European government at the time, we were put back on the defensive. And every time we were out in parliament, we had to explain what the ESM was all about, why we were doing what we were doing. This was, mind you, during the discussion about the first package. I wasn't intimately involved then yet uh, because I was foreign minister. I came in uh, with the third package, but back to that later. Now, what happened in the elections in Finland in 2011 was that two opposition parties were bashing on the Greek case. One were the Social Democrats, which were calling for collateral. No, George, I don't need to remind you about for collateral. This was a slogan. And the other one were the true Finns, which were basically, you know, telling Greece to go to hell and the European Union as well. The true Finns went from a marginal golden dawn type of a party, 4% in the elections 2007 to 18% in the elections in 2011, only because of the situation in the Eurozone. It is not the fault of Greece, it is not the fault of the ESM, but that was a political reality that we had to live with at the time. And I can tell you, it did not feel comfortable for someone who is extremely pro-European. On top of that, the true Finns did not want to come into government, but we had to create the Rainbow Coalition, which was led by my party chairman, former finance minister, Jyrki Katainen, and Joachim, who you will know very well, and George as well, who became prime minister of a six-party coalition together with the Social Democrats, which had one election promise 
on the European field, and that was to force the issue of collateral. So this was the sort of political squeeze that we were in. Right after the elections and the first package on Greece, the opinion poll showed that the true Finns became the biggest party in Finland. So this was the political reality in which the negotiations uh, took, took place. Then we moved from the phase of 2011 to 2014 to the change of, of, uh, of government in Greece and especially Tsipras and Syriza are coming in, the referendum and the negotiation of previous packages uh, to, to top it off. Um, and in Finland, we ended up having elections in 2015. We became uh, second. The true Finns came into government. And the true Finns had three election promises in 2015 in April. Number one, no more money to Greece. Number two, no more austerity in Finland. And number three, no more immigration. Now, what did I have to do as finance minister? Number one, push through the biggest austerity package in Finnish economic history. Number two, bail out Greece for a third time. And then number three, we ended up having the biggest influx of immigrants since World War II because of the asylum crisis. This was the political reality in which we negotiated the third package um, for, for, for Greece. Uh, and at that time, I can tell you that there was very much a division in the Eurogroup of good cup and bad cup. I had just become from prime minister to finance minister. And you can imagine the contacts that previous colleagues were giving in the summer, right before the European Council, which was going to decide on the third package. And on that third package, the Eurogroup, led by I will not name who, uh, had put into brackets a uh, time-limited suspension of Greek Euro membership. So this was how crucial the situation was at the time. Now, why do I say all of this? I say it because this was what it felt like, and this were the political realities at the time. Did we like doing it? Did I like doing it? No. But I can also tell you that when I boarded the plane for the last negotiation with Greece and the negotiating mandate that I got on a, co a government conference call, I told that the mandate that I'm being given to go into these negotiations is too limited. And if it doesn't change, and I, I said, I can't go in with it. And I, George, I'll tell you privately what it was about. And I think I have. Uh, and I said, um, I'm going to take my party out of government and break up government if, if this negotiating mandate hasn't changed. I boarded the plane, landed in Brussels, and actually the person who is now uh, the head of EFC, uh, Tuomas Sarenheimo in the Eurogroup, uh, he was able to loosen up uh, the conditions and we were able to find a path out uh, and a negotiation. So what I want to say by way of finishing is the following. Number one, it was very much an issue of trust and of uh, loyalty to your uh, voters and the classic argument of taxpayers' money. And that's what we see in all debates across Europe at the moment, doesn't matter what the subject is. Secondly, I do think that the summer of 2015, though it feels far away, was probably the make or break moment of it all. Yes, there were make and break moments on the way as well, but the fact that we were put, able to push through the third package, I think was key. And my final observation from all of this is to all of those who have written the wonderful report on the, on the ESM and all of those who, who lived through the crisis, listen, the European Union advances in three stages and the ESM is an example of it. Stage number one is a crisis. Stage number two is chaos. And stage number three is a suboptimal solution. That's what the ESM was at the time. And that is what the ESM continues to be. But with these kinds of reports, I think we can improve the ESM and get it right the next time around. And I'll finish off. I think we got it right during the COVID crisis because we used all the possible firepower we can have to avoid the type of a chaos that we ended up having in 2009, 2010, and 2011 because of the uh, ECB's PEP program, because of the EIB's lending, uh, because of the SHER program, uh, and of course, finally, because of the ESM and the recovery fund. So we learned our lessons and here we are now. Thanks, Alex, for bringing the political perspective and the importance of the two T's 
trust and taxes. I think that uh, I want to go now to back to Joaquin Almunia, he has to reply, and start the discussion. Let me just bring people already asking questions in the q and A. I just one because it's to everyone, and particularly to Joaquim, by Jan Pisani Ferry, colleague. The question to Joaquin and the panelists is, with, with hindsight, were the errors made primarily caused by intellectual, I mean, diagnosis and so on, institutional, the mandate and the institutions, principalism problems, or political, the constraints, as now we have just been analyzed or reminding. Depending on the ranking of the factors, what should be the priority reforms? So, Joaquim. Thank you very much, Ramon, and thank you very much to all of the panelists for their very, very interesting and uh, insightful comments. And thank you very much, of course, to all those who said that the report uh, is a good piece of work. The, the teamwork chaired by Cari has worked a lot, and I am very thankful for their support. And I am very thankful also to Klaus Reglin, as Managing Director of the ESM, for the uh, clear mandate that he gave to me, complementing the uh, Mario Centeno's mandate as Chairman of the Board of Governors. But Klaus, as Managing Director, said to me, Joaquin, you should work independently, and I will never interfere in your recommendations and the uh, orientation of this uh, evaluation report. The purpose is to learn lessons from what has happened, as many of you also said. The uh, purpose of the report is to avoid the same mistakes that could have been uh, committed in the past. And the purpose is to improve the way the ESM can work to reinforce the uh, Euro area and to help uh, the continuation of the programs to Greece that has suffered a lot for the social consequences and the economic consequences of the report. So thank you very much for this. Uh, I, I concur with many of the, of the uh, uh, positions and comments provided by all of, uh, of the panelists. I, I cannot, I cannot uh, tell you my ideas about the future of the ESM is not my responsibility. My responsibility concludes with the recommendations and uh, I am sure that the ESM uh, management, and Nicola is here as one of the most important elements of this management to draw the lessons, not only of the Greek crisis and the Eurozone serious problems during those years, but also about the lessons that we are again learning and suffering from the pandemic. So from this point of view, I am optimistic. As uh, Alexander said, the decisions adopted by the EU in this last year, since the beginning of the pandemic until now, could have been unbelievable when George, Papa Constantino and myself at the end of 2009 were uh, scared by the uh, new figures that opening the books in Greece uh, showed us and by the consequences of these uh, serious problems in Greece created not only in this country, but also in the weakest economies and countries of the Eurozone as a consequence of negative spillovers. So it's a, it's a very, very uh, positive learning process, a crisis indeed, and the economic crisis was a, a good learning process for the Euro area, but uh, this crisis will give us a second wave of lessons that we need also to integrate in our analysis. But I will not uh, dwell in the uh, future of the ESM. Maybe Nicola will say some things on this. And uh, let me go to the uh, Jean Pisani uh, questions quickly. What was the uh, most important factor of the uh, decisions adopted at the political level during the uh, Euro area crisis? 
in particular in the case of Greece, I think the most important element concerning Greece since the beginning, and maybe before the beginning of the crisis, was the serious lack of trust. And I think this was, this was not only the, the, the uh, reason why uh, Greece had difficulties to find a way out in the negotiations with the member states, with the ECB, with the Commission, and with the other members of the, of the institutions. The statistical uh, discrepancies that unfortunately the member states didn't allow me to tackle in 2004, 2005, because they didn't want it more uh, serious and effective instruments in the hands of Eurostat and in the Commission has created a big hole of mistrust. And I remember the first uh, conversations before 2010, at the end of 2009, on what to do with the enormous risks of Greece and the risk of uh, uh, loss of market access and the risk of uh, creating a contagion in the Euro area was seriously mediated by the lack of trust. Was not a very deep political uh, strategy based on the ideological issues to ask for a very serious and deep fiscal adjustment, ignoring the consequences of, uh, of the fiscal adjustment of such a magnitude into growth. Was lack of trust in my view, and maybe the second element, and uh, Alex also made reference to this, the internal problems of the Euro Eurozone political or governments, ministers as members of the government, in the uh, public opinion in the respective countries that were also suffering a financial crisis, rise of unemployment, destruction of jobs, uh, difficulties in the uh, public finances, difficulties with the functioning of their economies, not as serious, not as deep as the Greek problems, but serious problems also that created, created lack of trust in their national governments and internal problems that created a lot of political crisis and a lot of changes in, in the government. I think these are the two elements that in my view were the more serious obstacle to adopt decisions that now, with the benefit of hindsight, seems to us very rational and very necessary to uh, upload the uh, solution of the financial problems in the banking system in Greece. How to uh, combi combine the structural reforms needed with fiscal adjustments. How to combine the creation and the reinforcement of a safety net in a period of serious difficulties to uh, reduce public deficits. These were political problems that under normal circumstances are easier than in the circumstances that all the member states of the Euro area were suffering in 2010. 2012, still. 2012 was a clear inflection point with the uh, decisions of the European Council in June 2012, with the uh, decisions regarding the launch of a banking union, with the decisions uh, coming from Frankfurt, from uh, Mario Draghi, well, from London in the Mario Draghi's speech. This was a very uh, clear change of orientation that uh, gradually mm, has benefited the most efficient results obtained, in my view, during the third program, during the ESM program, with a small period of strong difficulties in Greece and beyond during the uh, six months of the first Syriza government. These are my comments. Thanks, Joaquin. Just very briefly, any other panelists want to intervene? We have a few questions, but the time is goes running, and also we want to hear at the end Nicola Humanelli what he says about the ESM. Very quickly, if I can come in on, on that particular question. Um, yeah. Yes, of course, the trust issues were very important, as, as uh, Joaquim said. And I think that it was clear from Alex's presentation how heavily the politics uh, 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 weight on this. I think that it, it of the three elements that, that Jean put in his question, 
um, it's clear that it's one is politics, second is intellectual. I think some of the diagnosis itself was wrong, apart from the political aspect, and finally come the institutional, the mandates and all that. But I think this is all interesting more if we think about in terms of the recommendations, what comes next. So part of the recommendations in the independent report that, that uh, uh, Joaquin has, has directed is how, where do you, how do you help the SM be able to make better decisions? And I think that's of course a very valid directions and, and you need to come out with these kinds of recommendations. There is a big question mark, however, which is that at the end of the day, the decisions will be in within a political environment. It's impossible to simply abstract from that and say, you know, look at the IMF, which has a much longer history of how, uh, it, of how it comes into countries. In 2010, the IMF was under tremendous pressure to basically come into an arrangement that they didn't really believe in uh, because there were larger issues of integrity of the system and, and politics. So in the same way, even though I fully commend and, 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 and support any kind of, of attempts to give the ESM staff and the ESM as an institution more independence and in being able to judge from an economic point of view what, uh, what uh, the prescription should be, I don't think it, it you know, we'll never get there uh, without a, a, a surrounding political climate, which thankfully has been moving in the right direction in the sense, I mean, the, the, the difference between the decisions taken in the, in the current crisis and, and, and the crisis back then is night and day, so it's clear. Ramon, Ramon, can I say a, a, a word, maybe a, an answer sure. to, to Sean? I think before the crisis, countries behaved as if they would not sit in the same boat. And therefore it was also, I mean, this Greece was not the only country which behaved in this way. And <clears throat> the problem was threefold. It was diagnostic because Greece benefited from the reliance on financial markets on a bailout. Yeah. The situation on the outside looked better than it was on the inside. It was a political issue. I think uh, if you if you read George's book uh, on on the on the start of the crisis, you can see there was also cheating on numbers. Yeah, we cannot ignore this. Uh, so it was an issue of recognition on both sides, and it was an institutional uh, issue. I think it's important to avoid uh, power games between institutions. Thanks. Yes. Can I just make a comment? Uh, very, quick, very quick, very quick. Very quick. Uh, um, take uh, the last slide of uh, uh, Joaquin, talking about privatization. Uh, now, after COVID, one of the big problems that we'll have is, for example, run procurement and rethink how private and public uh, can work together. And if you look at the level of investment in Greece, that is actually where possibly the problem is the, the how we think the the, the, the sector. Now, it is true is politics, but it's true also understanding how to do it. So again, I, I I think that we should keep all the three the three levels, right? The international domestic politics, but also there are things that are better than other, and uh, uh, it's good to know what they are, or at least you know understanding the consequence of one choice. You know if. Uh, especially if, it's, if, it's, if it is self-interested. Okay. Well, there are still a few questions, but uh, I want to pass the word to Nicola Kemanoli because we want to hear the perspective of the SN. Many questions have been raised. And as I said at the beginning, now it's uh, in part a turning point, although I agree with George, that's uh, just a small step that is what can be done. Nicola? Yes, thank you, Ramon. Uh, let me say that uh, for me it's a great pleasure to, to be part of this event. As you mentioned, uh, uh, the European University Institute is my alma mater, so I'm very proud and honored to be part of this. Also, I came across most of you in my uh, previous academic and professional career. Also, you, Ramon, remember me, the microeconomic course 25 years ago, it was very tough. So. Uh, uh, a lot of memories. Uh, let me say at the outset that uh, we at the ESM are very, very 
great, uh, very, we have a lot of gratitude for both uh, Gertrude Tungel-Gurel and Joachim Malugno for the two reports they produced uh, uh, in the last few years. Um, I would like to comment on all the uh, panelists' intervention, but this will, will, will make my intervention so long that uh, maybe I do it in another occasion. So better for me to focus on uh, the lessons that we are trying to learn from the report here at the ESM and how we try to address the recommendation. So again, as was outlined by both Gertrude and Joachim, we wanted this report to give us lessons and to learn and to provide answers to the question they posed to us and also to do it openly. So uh, we are not afraid of uh, saying that we could have made mistake. And by we, I would say it's not just the ESM because as you know, as we have discussed the programs involved other institutions, I would say the Euro area and the politicians all in, in a big group. So it's very difficult to disentangle who did what and who did better than the other. So for me, the lessons, of course, we take the lessons for ourselves, but there are a lot of lessons also to be taken by other actors and, and the stakeholders. So just uh, to give you an overview how we addressed uh, the recommendations, starting from the first report uh, uh, by uh, Gertrude, uh, is that the Board of Governors uh, immediately addressed uh, many of those uh, issues raised uh, uh, by, by her. And I would like to underscore that in particular, uh, we took very seriously the need to focus on the program credibility and support ownership, to set clear program objectives and priorities, and to establish cooperation agreements with our partner institutions, and to increase program transparency, improve the availability of our activities, but also to focus a lot on prevention. Um, we followed up uh, and I'm pleased to say today that three years later, we have accomplished a lot. Uh, while some recommendation from Gertrude reports, which uh, Joachim also made in his report remain to be addressed and we will discuss in a moment, a lot has been done. Internally, we agreed on principle for contingency buffer in future programs. We improved our record keeping practices and agreed together with the European Commission to prepare program closing reports in the future. We also develop uh, internal tools to better analyze and map key stakeholders in future programs, something, uh, an activity that uh, also the IMF is studying what we have been doing in that. So take into account all the stakeholders when you uh, run a program, not just the one you negotiate with, but uh, stakeholders in a program are, are, are really uh, a lot, uh, civil society, uh, social partners, uh, academia, something that has been somewhat neglected in, in, in the program. Uh, finally, to add more transparency and improve availability of our work, we develop a comprehensive and user-friendly database. I think this was referred to by some of the panelists of past program where there are a lot of information and uh, very useful for researchers to look into this uh, uh, database. The reform of the SM treaty that was agreed, uh, let's say on Monday, of course, needs to be ratified. Also address other important recommendations. First, to broaden the role of the ESM, uh, including uh, the possibility to assess macroeconomic and financial risks in all Euro area countries, not just the one that receive assistance from us. And also, uh, um, to focus on a preventive mandate, not just uh, as a crisis resolution mechanism, but as a crisis uh, prevention uh, mechanism. Uh, I think George mentioned that uh, uh, maybe the only new element of the reform is the fact that we would provide a backstop to the single resolution fund, and this has been advanced to 2022. I think this is a big step, it's not a small step, and it's not the only step, because uh, in the treaty reform, for example, there is a lot about uh, working together better with the European Commission, with our respective mandate. So for future program, future crisis, uh, we would somewhat overcome the Troika configuration, would be more European focused and with the Commission, the ESM at the center. 
And we have already uh, reached a great deal of cooperation with the European Commission in the ground. And since I was personally involved in the Greek program for five years, I can tell you that uh, uh, we have worked uh, together very well in the ground. Also, we were able to sign a memorandum of understanding with the Commission, and we are ready now to really announce this memorandum of understanding. Let me add uh, another important element of the ESM reform. Um, I, uh, which is the, um, let's say, improvement of the precautionary programs. Of course, uh, there has been a big debate. Uh, we started off by trying to make it more uh, attractive for members. Maybe we didn't succeed completely, but then we were taken by events and the COVID crisis uh, pushed us to develop the pandemic, uh, pandemic crisis support. So I think we are flexible enough and if there's political will to adapt uh, and also to respond to what Gertrude said, the ESM could do, could fill some gaps. I think if there's political will and there is a decision making conducive to that, we can be very flexible and adapt to the circumstances. Finally, let me say uh, 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 something on, on, on Joachim uh, uh, recommendation. So um, as was the case for the first report, the Board of Governors last June uh, mandated the ESM management to develop a follow-up action plan to this report. Uh, we agreed to bring this action plan to the Board of Directors in the course of next year. It might seem that you, we are moving a little bit slowly uh, compared to what we did with the first report, but I think there are two elements to be taken into account. The first one is that, of course, uh, this report was released in the middle of the pandemic. So, of course, we were very busy to address the current crisis, but we didn't forget, of course, to, to deal with the, uh, Joachim's uh, uh, recommendation. But also, the European Commission has launched uh, itself uh, an evaluation exercise. So I think to address uh, recommendations would be good to wait for the result also of that uh, report, since, uh, as I said, with the reform, European Commission, ESM will work most, more together in the future. So it would be good to tackle all the recommendations coming from different sources together in order to, in order to provide uh, uh, a sort of uh, coherent framework. Um, let me conclude by saying that uh, beyond uh, the two reports, uh, I think what we got uh, as, as, a, as an overarching lesson uh, is that it's very important for an institution to develop uh, uh, an evaluation function. So it's an attitude towards uh, 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 the, the life of an institution I think also the IMF in its history has developed this uh, with independent evaluation office. And we are also reflecting at the ESM. And this, I think, was also one of the recommendations of Joachim, how and what to evaluate in the future, because there is the concrete and pragmatic uh, uh, um, uh, work to address specific recommendations, but they also uh, uh, an understanding of an attitude which is shaping our institutions and would make institutions more, uh, uh, more um, adaptable to the, to the evolving situations. And I think uh, this is transparent, uh, what we are trying to do and the word of appreciation of Joachim for uh, Klaus Regling. And this is in our DNA and uh, we will try to do our best uh, to address uh, not just the recommendation of reports, but also the needs uh, of our citizens and, and our member. So uh, thank you very much, Ramon, and, and all of you for, for this uh, very good discussion uh, around the report. Thank you, Nicola. And I just want to conclude because we are running out of time. I really wanna thank all the panelists and all the participants. There have been other questions being asked. They're all in the chat and Q&A and for people and panelists to interact. And I think that uh, there is a main lesson, if we can say one out of all of them, which is now with the next generation package, which hopefully will be active very soon, I think is the great opportunity to build up trust in European level. Citizens are exhausted. 
and they want to see concrete measures being taken. There will be a lot of funds, but they also need to be properly used. And as I say, as we saw in the, my graph at the beginning, there is a huge divergence within the European Union and Euro area. And it's a task of all the institutions to play together. I'm sure the SM will learn on this and has learned and he will take the role that he can and should have, which is way beyond what the IMF because it's part of the union and your area. Thanks to all of you. And that's been a joint initiative of the Pierre Werner Chair on the ESM, European Stability Mechanism. And we continue other times. Thanks to all of you and thanks for this discussion. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hey all, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you.